My uh, name is Charlie Kettle. I'm a professor emeritus at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. And I think I was the inaugural uh, fellow at the Center for Science and Policy. Um, I uh, uh, stepped down as director of the Scripps Institution uh, in September of 2006. And at that point, I was faced with the problem of all uh, people who stepped down from uh, preoccupying jobs. What would I do next? What could I do next? And the only answer that I had available to me was to do what directors do, which is to interpret the science that their people in their institution are working on, interpret that science uh, to policymakers in hopes that uh, society in some way or another will benefit. We started uh, um, concentrating not on the science of climate change, which uh, was evolving, but was also uh, pointed to a clear problem. We um, started focusing on solutions. And solutions were um, uh, involved a much broader sector of society. It involved urban planning and it involved environmental protection. It involved public solutions, involved public health. Solutions involved finance, as we now see. Uh, solutions involved reorientation of industrial policy. Cambridge couldn't teach me much about the science of climate change, but it could teach me a whole hell of a lot about the social science and the uh, other sciences that are involved in seeking solutions. Humans have changed the Earth's surface to such an extent that if geologists a thousand years from now would come back, they would call our era, the era that we live in, the Anthropocene era, the era in which the, the properties of the Earth's surface are determined by our actions and what we have done. Now, it occurred to me that there was a corollary to uh, Paul Crutzen's view, and that is that actually uh, what we are thinking today, uh, what we are thinking collectively today will be realized tomorrow in tomorrow's actions, in industrial developments and things of that sort. And those actions ultimately will determine the planet's capacity to sustain life in the future. So in some sense, the environment and the planet of the future in the Anthropocene is contained in the way we think today. Later, I began to ask, how do these three factors, population, uh, environmental degradation, ecological collapse, if you will, and climate change, how do they fit together? The, uh, and I realized that there is actually a coming crisis that we can almost time. Many people have said this, but I think I like this way of phrasing the crisis. There's an unclear and very complicated relationship between population density, population activities, and environmental and ecological change, but there's definitely one. And uh, at the global level, uh, even though it's complicated uh, at the regional level, at the global level, I think it's uh, easy to, it's somewhat simpler to spot that, um, that the, the environmental pressure will not increase forever. In fact, the demographers predict that at sometime near the end of the century, 2075 perhaps, the world population will peak and then go down. So this meant also that the human stress on the environment has a good chance of declining at that point. Now that's not, uh, that may be good news to some, but it doesn't mean that our descendants are going to get out of, uh, get out of this uh, uh, harmlessly and escape from, without uh, serious problems. Um, what it really does mean, reinterpreting it, is that at that time, population resource uh, demands by population growth, environmental pressure, and climate change will all approach their all-time peaks at the same time that the number of humans at risk is the largest. So this convergence of the three factors is the Anthropocene crisis. 
And, uh, and if you go back and say that the Anthropocene is that we are creating in the Anthropocene the world that human beings are thinking about and wanting, then it's clear that what we think today can affect what will happen in the future. I think that the, the biggest problem, especially for someone uh, living in the United States, uh, is the fact that people don't see how big the crisis is going to be. Uh, and we have encountered a great deal of resistance to dealing with the crisis. Sometimes it's political opposition, but in, there's a kind of generalized resistance that our, the, our inability of our society to respond to the coming danger uh, is, I think, um, the biggest problem that we have. Uh, I think, put it a, a, another way, the, the Paris Conference, which is uh, on climate, in which the nations of the world uh, promised to reduce their uh, greenhouse gas emissions, also revealed a disconnect between knowing what we need to do to deal with the climate issue and wanting to do it. And even at the time of maximum uh, am diplomatic friendship and amity on this issue in the Paris conference, the nations couldn't agree uh, to limit their emissions to the point where uh, you could avoid the two degree threshold uh, where temperature growth would uh, produce, we knew would produce serious uh, impacts on society and nature. They couldn't agree. And so the facts are that every nation in the world, even the most ardent, uh, is having trouble mobilizing the will to produce uh, a comp to attack the Anthropocene crisis on its uh, in time and at a scale large enough to deal with it. There's something deeply human about this resistance, but perhaps the resistance and the Anthropocene itself is coming from the way the human brain thinks, the way the human brain thinks. And I began to think then that, uh, that uh, think about the, the new, new discoveries in neuroscience that um, have occurred in the last uh, uh, 20 years. And Daniel Kahneman wrote this, uh, all this up in uh, um, a book that he called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. Now, human beings have known for a long time that there's a dual nature to human thought, that we have emotions and we have rationality. Um, we have left brains and we have right brains. There have been all sorts of people uh, all throughout history that have, con have thought about uh, the two ways that human beings think, emotionally and rationally, and the conflict between the two that shapes character. Uh, the ancient, also, human beings have understood for a long time that this dual nature of human thought has influenced institutions. Uh, the ancient Greeks were, uh, were worried about the instability of democracies and the reliability of republics. Uh, in the Middle Ages, there was a division between church and state that, uh, that reflected the dual ways that human beings are thinking and dual ways of organizing their behavior. But now we know from modern experiments in neuroscience, in fact, that human beings have two systems of thought, a level one, which is the emotional level, and level two, which is the rational level. And the problem that, that we have is that level one was designed to be the quick responder to danger. It was the, the human brain's first responder and it's not interested in the future, it just responds on the moment. And so our, unless something else intervenes, the human, natural human uh, tendency is to respond to the short-term needs. And this is the fundamental problem that we have with the crisis that will come in 50 years and the fact that people can uh, resist doing something about it uh, even though they know that every, it will affect every human being on Earth uh, 70, 50, 75 years from now. So what is the answer? 
Uh, is it uh, better economics? Uh, is it, I mean, my friend Partha Dasgupta would say that economists don't know how to include the value of nature in the national accounts, uh, that we, we ignore the long-term and market economics, which is true. So maybe we should change the way we think in economics. Um, should we overcome all of the, all of the difficulties that we have uh, in discussing population, all the moral conflicts that, and cultural and religious conflicts, and at least think about it as a practical problem that if we could reduce population growth even a little bit, it might uh, reduce the pressure at the peak of the maxim, the peak of the crisis. Um, uh, should we uh, should we uh, uh, should we couple social justice and environmental security? Do they uh, are they separate or do they work together? And so, should we change the way we think? But we cannot do that unless we have uh, uh, unless we have. Uh, a greater sense of intergenerational uh, altruism. That we have to think much, we have all of us to think much more, uh, have to have keep the future in mind as we make short-term present decisions. But the kind of altruism that I'm thinking about is, uh, is collective and intergenerational. Uh, now, We've seen a tremendous advance in society, actually, in the last uh, 100 years. Uh, a great material advance in society and civil violence and, and, uh, and social justice have improved despite all of the crises that occupy our, our lives, uh, short-term lives in the media. So there's been this great advance, but the question is, at the current rate at which society is advancing, at the current rate at which society is advancing, can we muster enough altruism and decision making to solve the problem on the time that it's coming, on the 50 year time scale that it's coming?